Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do so is to like us on Facebook. We post all sorts of information there. And don't forget that there's an audio version of this message on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Foundry Church. With that said, let's dive into our Advent series called Expecting. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I wonder why Mary's left town so suddenly. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Isn't Mary engaged to Joseph? Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And will call him Amen. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Since I am a virgin. Did you hear about Mary's condition? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Mary, Mary, I believe you. The angel told me not to be afraid to take you home as my wife. What is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. For the child is born, plus the son of the and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Hey everyone, my name is Matt Kuman, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, we are in the last part of this series on expectations and expecting. And so far throughout the series, we've been talking primarily about different people in the Bible who had specific expectations about who Jesus was going to be. Some of the expectations about what mighty God meant, what wonderful counselor means, some of those kinds of things. But today, we're going to be focusing on some specific characters that met Jesus and what they did after they seen those expectations and what he actually brought. So we're going to be talking about three different characters. Uh, first, we're going to spend some time on shepherds um, and then the magi, and we're going to end with angels till tonight. So by doing that, we're going to start with shepherds. And many of you have heard this story out of Luke. We're going to be in Luke 2, uh, verse 8 through 20. It's kind of the classic Christmas story. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Uh, we're going to start there. So Luke 2, verse 8 through 20. Starting at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. You can picture this scene, right? As a shepherd, it's getting dark out, and all of a sudden the sky is bright, and there's an angel speaking out. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary treasured up all of those things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So let's talk about these shepherds for just a minute. Because it's interesting to know the context around who this angel is appearing to first. You see, when we think of shepherds, some of you may be thinking of in the Old Testament, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who were shepherds of huge flocks. And it was actually kind of a prestigious thing to be a shepherd and have a huge flock because that's primarily what you did back in that day and age. But as things progressed, uh, more people moved away from having a flock of sheep and goats into having crops and farmland. And if there's anything that destroys farmland and crops most, it's whatever is just grazing throughout the lands on the open terrain. Right? So sheep and goats would actually destroy a lot of the cropland that these farmers would be producing. So by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the shepherds have gone from a kind of a very high prestigious level back with Abraham and Isaac to a spot where they're really low on the Palestinian kind of social class. We talked a few weeks ago about tax collectors and how they were hated amongst most of society. And these shepherds were actually on that same level with tax collectors. They were really kind of a hated group of people. Uh, There's a historian named Jeremiah, and he documents the fact that shepherds weren't even given the right to, like, vote and be held account for being a witness because no one actually believed they would tell the truth. He also says that he wrote to buy wool or milk or a kid, which isn't an actual child, it's a little goat, for those of you who don't know that. They're not buying children. Uh, this, This kid that they would buy... Uh, is if they would buy it from a shepherd, it was actually forbidden. They weren't allowed to buy things from shepherds because it was the assumption that if you're buying things from a shepherd, the shepherd was probably stealing it from something. These shepherds were not looked highly upon at all. You get the sense of who these shepherds were. And if you put yourself in their shoes, as they're sitting out in the field, you have to think what expectations they had on themselves. Am I worth anything at all? Does anyone view me as something higher than the lowest rung on the totem pole? You see, you can imagine they felt a bit worthless. But what I love is that when the angel came down to them, the word that he specifically used was, I'm, the, the Savior has come for all people. Right? Do you think that word reigned true in these shepherds' in these shepherds' ear? When they heard that, are they thinking, oh, it's, it's for even us? Even we are allowed to, to hear these things? See, God chose the shepherds to be the first ones that he told about his son being born. And what's even more interesting is that when the shepherds hear this, they run off to the manger in Bethlehem right away. And when they get there, I'm sure they're expecting tons of people to be gathered around because, of course, the angel would for sure appear to the more higher class and the people who knew the scriptures really well. Of course, the angels would appear to them. And what do they find? It's just Mary and Joseph and the baby in a manger. See, what they realize is that You know, the Savior of the world was told to them first. See, he came for all people, even the lowest of the low. What they find is that they're the first ones on the scene. See, the shepherds, at that point, they don't stop and say, okay, it's, it was great meeting you. Now we're going to go back to the sheep who we kind of left out in the wilderness. We better run back to them. Right? They, they don't do that. They end up going into the city and spreading the good news about what they had found. But what they didn't do is they didn't think, well, we've been told all this good information, but if we go into the city, there's no way those people will believe us. They, we're not even allowed to be witnesses for specific things. There's no way this city will actually recognize what we say. They didn't worry about any of those things. They knew they had a message to get across to the city, and they weren't afraid what people thought about it. Right? They lived an adventurously expectant life because of how Jesus showed up in their life. That's the shepherds. 
Next group of people we have are the Magi. And the Magi is kind of a weird word. It's, sometimes it's referred to as wise men. Um, and back in that day and age, most of the Magi or wise men would, do, would be like chemists. They'd be scientists. Some of them would watch the stars and be astrologers. Um, and one thing they noticed is they'd actually know some of the prophecies in the Old Testament. And we talked about some of those prophecies a few weeks ago. But one thing they knew is that at one point, a star rose from the east. And they knew from one of the prophecies in Numbers that out of the line of David, when the star rises from the east, there, there's something important that's coming out of that. So when they see that star rising from the east, they head off and follow that star. See, and we don't know exactly how far these magi traveled. We don't know what distance they came. There's some speculation that they got to him by the time he was five years old, which would be a tremendous journey, right? There's, there's some people that say he, they had to walk hundreds of miles to get there. But regardless, you can think they had a journey that they had to go on, right? And on that journey, they... It wasn't like today's journeys, right? It's not where you pop in a DVD for the kids in the back and they're good for like 18 hours because they're watching Star Wars all the way through, right? It's, it's a day and age where there's no pit stops. There's, there's nothing to entertain people along the way. You see, when, even when they found Jesus, they, what did they do? They gave him gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Not only did they travel this huge distance but they gave of themselves in an incredible way. See, what, what happens when you have an opportunity to travel? I know when I have an opportunity to travel, I think about, okay, um, I'm going to need to make sure I ask off for work from long, for long enough. Um, that is going to cut into my pay a bit. I should make sure I'm not gone that long. Um, I wonder if that's going to hurt the retirement account if I'm not working that much, right? Um, if I'm gone that long, we'll have to pay someone to watch the dog. We have all these costs that we think about, right? We, we count the costs of an opportunity that comes up. But what do you notice when the Magi are faced with an opportunity to go meet Jesus? They're not counting the costs. They have an incredible journey, and they're giving huge gifts of themselves, and they do not count the costs. They were willing to part with the treasures that they had. See, these Magi lived an adventurously expectant life because they knew who Jesus was going to be. See, in the last group of people we're going to talk about is the angels. And I, I love what the angels have in this. And we're going to reread what we read right in the beginning from Luke 2. But I want you to listen with what the angel, there's one specific angel that shows up and a group of angels that comes in after. So think specifically to what the angels are doing. Verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, so we just have one angel on the scene so far. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be a, cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Suddenly, remember that word. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. See, when I was first studying this and looking through these passages, I thought, why, why is it suddenly? Right? When you think of suddenly, it's not, of, not one where your alarm goes off and you slowly roll out of bed. Right? It is suddenly why would it be suddenly in this instance? Right? When I started doing some more digging, what I found is that, and I didn't really process this well, but what I found is that angels are not all-knowing, right? Angels aren't God. They, they were created at the beginning of time, but they're not all-powerful. They're not all-knowing like God is. And what that means is that the, the secret of how God would save the world was as much anticipation for these angels 
as it was for the humans on earth. You see, you have to picture when God comes down to Abraham and said, out of you we will have many descendants. The angels have to be thinking, oh, I wonder if the Messiah is going to come out of that line. Right? And then as, as uh, the angels appear to David, and God comes down and talks to David and says, out of you a king will be born. And the angels must be thinking, Oh, oh we, we have to watch this specific line. There's going to be a king like no other born out of this line specifically. Okay, we can watch for that. And then when God sends Gabriel down to the Virgin Mary to give her the news, they have to be thinking, is, is this the time? Is, is it finally going to happen? It's been hundreds of years. Is this the time that it's going to happen? Do you think it's going to happen now? suddenly, right? When you think of suddenly, think of uh, Black Friday at Walmart when the doors finally open and the crowd just rushes through, right? Suddenly, if you've ever been to a rodeo or seen a bucking bronco where the door is finally let loose and so much power just busts out of there, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, Peace to men on whom his favor rests. Suddenly, what if those angels couldn't even contain themselves in heaven anymore, that they had to let it all out in front of everyone because they knew that this, they, they were waiting for this moment for centuries. Talk about adventurously expectant. Right? Thinking about the heavenly realm not even being able to contain the angels' excitement for what was to come. See, I love that. I love the energy that comes out of a moment like that. You see, we have the shepherds, the magi, and the angels, but I don't know if they even fully understand what the Son of God is going to do. Right? He came in a manger, but they don't yet know the miracles that he's going to do, the way he is going to show up to people who have never imagined they show up to him before. He would die on the cross for the sins of Everyone, did they even comprehend what that was going to look like? You see, we know all those stories. We know what Jesus did, and we know how he came back to the disciples and said, I'm, I'm leaving now, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will be back. I'm coming back. See, we know all of those things. We know the truth about who Jesus is and what he's going to do. See, but what are you going to do knowing that truth? Are you living differently knowing the truth that Jesus is coming back again? How are you living in that aspect? You see, I want you to put yourself in a story with me. It's 1971. Anyone born in 1971 by this point? Yeah, that's some of you, very few. Okay, see, gas at that point was 40 cents. Movie tickets were $1.50. Um, the fastest car was a Lincoln Continental Mark III. Yeah, it went from 0 to 60 in 11.3 seconds. So living life on the edge, right? <laughs> this is life. But imagine you're 20 years old, 1971, and a friend comes up to you and says, I've got this idea, and it could revolutionize the world. I don't know how it's going to take, and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort are you in it with me? Do you want to be an investor? And you're probably thinking, well, I'd like to probably know more about what's going to happen. How much do I need to invest? All of these questions are coming in your mind, right? But it's 1971. What if I told you that you knew what was going to happen in 50 years with that company? What if I said that friend that was coming up to you was Steve Jobs? And he said, I've got an idea for something that's going to revolutionize the world. See, would you jump on with that company? Would you invest with what they were doing? Would you say, yes, yes, let me help. I would love to be a part of this because you know that in 50 years, so by 2020, Apple becomes a $1 trillion company. See, would you help launch it? Would you help invest in it? Of course you would. Because you know what's coming. 
See, would you sit through five years of testing and failing and testing and failing and trying new things that have never been tested before to finally come out with the first Mac that there's only actually 50 of them, the Apple One? See, imagine the testing and failing that would take place. Would you continue through the struggles? What if Steve Jobs comes up and say, we have been trying at this so hard, it's been taking so much work, is it actually worth it? What would you say? Oh, of course it's worth it. You have no idea what's coming. We just have to keep pushing. We just have to keep trying as hard as it might be. You have no idea the reward that we're going to have at the end of this. See, if you knew what struggles and hardships and setbacks would come, would you still be involved? See, of course you do. Of course you would because you know what the end is going to look like for that company. See, the shepherds, the magi, and the angels lived an adventurously expectant life for a baby they knew would change the world. We we know what he did, right? We know what Jesus did, how he came to die for our sins on a cross, and we know he's coming back again. But if you knew, if you know that, would you do anything different if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? See, how would you live your life differently if you knew he was coming back tomorrow? How, how, would, you, how would you expect to live? See, I love how the message says this out of Romans Romans 8, 15 through 17. The message is a different version than we typically read, but it says it really beautifully with some great words that I love. So verse 15 says this, this resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our hearts and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. See, what is stopping you from living an adventurously expectant life. See, is it time where you feel like you have to work so much, you have to, your schedule, when you look at the calendar for what's coming in the next weeks, you see how busy that calendar is and you can't seem to fit anything in. So the first thing to always go is spending time with God, right? What would it look like to pick up devotions and actually dive in and be intentional about the time you're spending with God. We're about to start a new year. What would it look like to say this year, I'm going to spend more time with God. I'm going to put aside 20 minutes every day when I wake up in the morning to spend time in his word because you value whatever you put your time into. See, adventurously expecting people will put away the idea that the calendar is crazy full, but what matters is spending time with the God who saved us. Is it money? Maybe you don't feel like you can give to the church or give to needs that come up in the area or in the community because your 401k isn't like you want it to be yet. Well, it might push retirement back. Well, maybe we can't take that vacation like we typically do. Living adventurously expectant is sometimes uncomfortable, right? Because we don't know what step God is going to have us take in the next direction. But I want you to understand that we don't have to know the full plan before we take the step in that direction. All we have to do is just take that first step in saying, I want to give you this time. I want to give you my treasures. We, we talked about the Magi and the trevor, treasures and, and the time that they gave up. Right? What would it look like for us to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to give that to you so I can live adventurously expectant. And with this question with me, how are you going to live an adventurously expectant life? What does this look like for you? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. 
And I thank you that you came and showed up to the shepherds in a way that they didn't even expect. And I ask that as we look at our time and we look at our treasures and talents, that you help us figure out what is important and how we can maybe even get rid of some of those to live an adventurously expectant life in you. Would you help us do that? In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of what we call our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again next week.